Coming up on DTNS, machine learning may cut down the time you spend in an MRI machine. Our cyborg future just got a little closer, and our best guesses at the epic endgame. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 18th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Also in Los Angeles, I'm Lamar Wilson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Ah, uh, we were just talking about film photography. Uh, Sarah had a, a very cool find. If you want to hear us talk about that, go check out Good Day Internet. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. The latest Microsoft Flight Simulator is out on Windows 10 on Xbox Game Pass for PC, the Microsoft Store, and Steam. This is the first flight simulator since Microsoft Flight in 2012. The company is billing it as a relaunch of the franchise. Players can claim a free Aviators Club uh, livery set for Wednesday. Livery. livery. It's a livery. Thing. Yeah. It's a <laughs> Plain people mm -hmm. probably understand it better than me. Livery set for Wednesday, August 19th through September 30th, 2020 in the InSim Marketplace. Sarah, you look like you're in Flight Simulator right now. I feel um, like it. <laughs> Apple announced it's renaming its Beats One streaming service to Apple Music One. That's original. And is launching two new hosted stations within the Apple Music app. Apple Music Hits and Apple Music Country. Don't worry. Zane Lowe is still hosting on Apple Music One. Calm down. Worldwide. Uh, the download page for Notepad++ is now banned in China. Users there will see a message saying the page contains content prohibited by local regulators. The ban, which started August 12th, seems to be in reaction to a Stand with Hong Kong edition of the software released last month. However, Notepad++ also released a free Uyghur version last October, uh, so it could be in response to both of those. NVIDIA's cloud gaming service GeForce Now is now available in beta on Chrome OS and uses WebRTC, that's Web Real-Time Communications, to stream games in the Chrome browser without needing a dedicated app. NVIDIA says users need at least 15 megabits per second, though 25 is recommended. Samsung announced it will provide three generations of Android updates to its newest gallery, Galaxy head, handsets, uh, which include the Galaxy S series, Galaxy Note series, Galaxy Foldable Devices, Galaxy A Series, and the Tab Series of tablets, which all uh, will receive Android 11 in September as update number one. Uh, uh, Samsung only committed to two generations of Android updates in the past. Well, look at Samsung. Uh, anyone who has driven the large empty spaces in the United States that include nothing but a highway probably know loves truck stops, or as they are known now, loves travel stops. Electrify America has announced a partnership Tuesday to install electric vehicle charging stations at loves locations across the U.S., the stations will charge at rates of up to 350 kilowatts at about 20 miles of range per minute. First five locations are up and running in Oklahoma, New Mexico, Utah, and Florida. Axios' sources say that Snapchat is testing a feature that would let users share Snapchat content off of the platform, even if it isn't their own, such as original shows, content from Discover Partners, and our stories, which are photos and videos around a particular topic or event. The Financial Times reports Oracle might be interested in acquiring TikTok's business in the U.S., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, and has held preliminary talks with TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, already. That joins the previous reports of Microsoft and Twitter being interested as well. Meanwhile, TikTok launched a $1 billion creator fund in Europe to give grants to those with at least 10,000 followers and 100 views. Uh, sources close to the show report quick acceptance of applications. <coughs> hmm. Excuse me. Oh, Sorry. Who would that be? <laughs> All right. Hmm. Let's talk a little more about a change to how you log into an Oculus device. Let's do it. Facebook will remove support for Oculus accounts in October. That means new accounts made after that time will have to be through Facebook. Existing users with an Oculus account can keep using that account until January 1st, 2023. Then they'll too be forced to merge their Oculus account with a Facebook account. All users can maintain a VR profile in Facebook with a separate friends list. Now, if you don't merge the account, your headset will work, but some games and apps won't function in the future. Oh, 
And even if you do keep your Oculus account, future Oculus devices will require you to use a Facebook account to set it up. So Facebook is going to make it really hard for you <laughs> not to just use a Facebook account with Oculus. Yeah, I, I can already hear people jumping to the conclusion that this is somehow uh, malicious, and who knows, maybe it is. Uh, but if it weren't Facebook, the way I would interpret this is a company wants to manage its privacy policy, its data retention policy, all of the policies on that are that are needed to operate user login and user identification simply. Uh, and if you can combine Oculus and Facebook as one login, that makes it that much simpler to, to manage. And when you're talking about Oculus and Facebook, they have a very huge number uh, of, of people uh, to manage. So anything that simplifies it will probably save them quite a bit of money. Yeah, when yeah, I no, got, oh, go ahead, Lamar. I was gonna say real quick, uh, Google did a very similar thing with Nest. You know, uh, Nest had a, a separate sign in and, and mm -hmm. they just kind of unified that for similar reasons. So, you know, as long as the VR profile, as I was saying pre-show, is separate from uh, my friends list on Facebook. Like, I don't want those two interacting with each other. As, as long as they maintain that, like, it, to me, it's fine. Like, they're gonna do it on Instagram eventually too, I'm, I'm sure. Just, yeah, you know, just one account. Well, and there's a lot of Facebook integration on Instagram that didn't used to be there as well. Um, yeah. When I when I got my Quest a few months ago, Oculus Quest, I had the option to just kind of sign in and get into the App Store for Oculus easily using my Facebook account, and I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. I mean, it's a Facebook company. It it didn't seem weird to me. So I'm kind of of that. I'm I'm in the, <laughs> the 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 folks who are like oh so nothing changes that's cool I don't have a separate separate Oculus account I'm using Facebook as it is but yeah if for some reason you really want to stay off Facebook or you don't like the idea of the two being intertwined it doesn't I mean you it, it it sounds like a mild annoyance more than really anything that's going to change your Oculus experience yeah, yeah. And, and if you, if that was the issue that you had you probably should have got a Vive <laughs> because right, they've always right. kind of owned Oculus where last yeah. several years yeah yeah if you've been using oculus an oculus account to log in you've been giving your data to facebook even this is like saying i'm i i'm done with safeway i'm only shopping at pavilions same company <laughs> uh so you know like it, it's it's the data is on the same data center it's accessible to the same company uh they're just simplifying the login route uh, and making sure that the policies are clear on both. So uh, it, it, now at least, uh, honestly, it's probably better because now it's very clear that you're giving your data to Facebook, whereas before you may not have realized it because you're like, oh, no, but I'm using Oculus. Maybe you didn't know Facebook owned Oculus. I don't know. Yep, there you go. So Uber and Lyft are both considering changing to a franchise model in California, and the plan would have the companies provide their technology platform to operators of vehicle fleets. Those operators would then be responsible for employing drivers. I see what they're doing. So Uber and Lyft contend that they only provide a platform for drivers to connect with riders, and this will remove the companies from the drivers one more step. Both companies say they prefer to keep the current model if possible. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I see what they're do doing here. It, it's, it's, a, it's a slick way to kind of circumvent the, the, the California rules. And I think we were, we were asking earlier uh, in the pre-show, like, where would these fleets suddenly come from. I know uh, yeah. Amazon, Amazon for their delivery has different outsourced fleets. I, they come to my house all the time. And it's like, yeah, they, it's just clear they're not working you know, with, with Amazon. It's a third party company. Uh, that has a, Although a I like the idea fleet. of an Amazon truck coming and pick me up for my Uber ride. That'd be kind yeah. of hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so where do these fleets come from? Are, are these new businesses that get created? Well, so, I remember when Uber was in its infancy, it used to be called Uber Taxi. It started in San Francisco. I knew some folks who were, you know, who had founded the company. And so I was a very early adopter. And back in those days, you got limos all the time because basically you were just hiring somebody who was driving, you know, a, 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 a you know, kind of black car service. That's what it was. It was a taxi rival. Um, and that's why they ended up having to drop the taxi name eventually. So that would be a fleet, right? Mm -hmm. That was something that yep. already existed. This was a mm -hmm. platform that could leverage uh, the existence of these drivers kind of waiting around to, you know, to to be able to pick somebody up and, and get some money. But, I mean, we're on such a larger scale than those days at this point. Yeah, it's sort of like, how many fleets are there? Do they mm -hmm. crop up out of nowhere because now there's a demand? But more importantly... If Uber and Lyft want to be like, you know what, we cannot deal with hiring all these people as employees, let's just have the fleet do it. 
does the fleet want to do that either? I mean, you're just passing this headache on to another company who may not want to do it either. I, uh, that's a real, you know, I hadn't even thought about black yeah, car really and taxis. Like there, there's your easy ones, right? Especially if they can make their peace with taxi companies and say like, Hey, what if we, you know, what if we included you? Cause we've done it in other markets in Japan, your Uber ride is a taxi. Uh, that, that that's the only way they're oh, really? allowed to do it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, they, they integrate with certain taxi companies. So maybe they can cobble enough. They already have a bunch of deals with black car services already. That's now the, you know, the more expensive version of Uber that you never pay for because it's like $200 a ride. That's the, that's the black car it, side of that. I've, yeah. So I've, I've done it. maybe they have you really? Yeah. How, what was it like? <laughs> I've been in one that someone nice. else paid for. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, like, uh, that's, Maybe they they expand those deals. Maybe they add some deals. But would that be enough to cover California, or would that be the point? Is like, hey, fine, we're just a fleet service now. And uh, guess what, California? Now you don't have as many ride options. I don't know. Let's talk about Indiana. Four cities in Indiana filed a lawsuit August fourth against Netflix, Disney, Hulu, Directv, and Dish Network. The cities of Indianapolis, Evansville, Valparaiso, and Fishers, Indiana, three of those cities I have actually been to, all believe that the companies violated Indiana state law because they did not pay the cable franchise fee of 5% gross revenue per city. That's the state law in Indiana. If you operate a cable service in a city, you owe that city 5% of the gross revenue you created off the citizens of that city. The law applies to companies that transmit video programming, quote, through facilities located at least in part in a public right of way. Now, when that law was created, it was, I'm a cable company. I string my cable through the public right of way. City gives me an exemption for that. And because of that, I have to pay this tax. The cities are now arguing that since the services run on the internet and the internet is delivered, at least for wired, using public right of way, that the law should apply to them, which is a little bit of an inside out logic because the internet service doesn't have to pay this tax, only video service. So an ISP doesn't have to pay this tax to use the right of way. They may have to pay a different <laughs> yeah. tax, but not this one. But they're saying because Netflix runs over those lines and those lines are in the public right of way, now Netflix has to pay that tax. Uh, a similar case in Creepcore, Missouri is pending in circuit court. Uh, most of the legal experts that John Brodkin at Ars Technica talked to think this probably will fail in court. And even if it didn't, once it gets to the federal level, FCC law very clearly prevents this sort of thing. But it's a it's an interesting attempt. So what's the point? What are just to get these? They're trying to get that a, tax money because uh, nobody has cable anymore, Lamar. So the mm -hmm. revenue they're getting from that five percent off cable service has been going down every year. I'm just surprised. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder how far the argument goes of, okay, well, it's not delivered the way cable was delivered in the past, but it's the same bundle more or less, you know, at least not, not necessarily Netflix, Disney, Hulu, or, but direct TV dish, you, you start getting, you know, and, well, and there are, there are other uh, with options as well. And dish, they're saying direct TV and dish have apps and therefore those apps are delivering video over the internet. Well, no, no. I mean, I, I, I'm saying that th they might have a little bit more of a leg to stand on with those because it's a, it's more of a here's a bunch of different networks that we are providing to you like a cable service. You know, Disney might say, well, but they're not trying to tax the ISP, right? They're going after each right. company individually. No, yeah, yeah no, it will make more sense. No, I get it. Yeah. yeah, I, I mean, listen, I, I don't know if, if this this case goes anywhere, but I can see where Indiana's like, well, hold on, you know, the rules are different. Uh, maybe yeah. they need to be rewritten a little bit, but we'd like some money, please. We're, we're missing, you know, 10,000 to a hundred thousand dollars a year off this, uh, this tax and we need to figure out a way to get it. Maybe we can get it out of Netflix and Disney. They seem to have a lot of money. I, I mean, didn't Indiana just get gravity? I didn't know they even had internet. That's, that's hey now, hey now. Uh, oh, okay. So, settle down, I'm, Chicago. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. It, that was a Chicago <laughs> hit. Gravity. That, that was a very <laughs> Chicago <laughs> bit of you coming out there. So, well, I actually thought, about, I was like, Gravity the movie? What's that? Oh. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> let's talk about New York. Let's shift, let's shift it here. Yeah, a, let's collaboration, <laughs> a collaboration between New York University and Facebook AI research called Fast MRI use machine learning to accelerate MRI scans of knees. Now, the algorithm was trained to eliminate redundant imagery using about 75% less data. It's pretty incredible. 
Evaluations from expert radiologists were not significantly different when using their fast MRI versions of scans. Now, without knowing which were which, radio radiologists judge MRI scans, excuse me, fast MRI scans to be of higher quality. Um, I have been in an MRI machine. Mm. We don't like to be in there long. Yeah. Don't like to be in there long. So um, the faster, the better. I'm supporting the fast MRI because that's that's uh, that, that's an experience, boy. Yeah, I mean, I know this is just knees for now, but as somebody who for uh, this not recently, thank goodness, but for a time, I was having MRIs a lot, and they are, if you are even mildly claustrophobic, they are really unpleasant, uh, and if you're very claustrophobic, they can be uh, sort of impossible, but, but necessary. Um, I used to have to take, like, anti-anxiety medication, just so I could, like, because I knew I was going to be there for a yeah. while. You know, and just, you know, kind of not freak out and uh, anything that can speed up that process and, you know, just be, you know, better data wise um, and and help the people that are supposed to be helping the patients is awesome. Yeah. yeah I mean, so. if, you're, if you're trying to wrap your head around this and it, the study used knees uh, because that's the data set they have. But once they have this working, they, it could work for any body part. So it wouldn't necessarily be limited to knees. Uh, but it's like lossy compression on an MP3. The MP3 gets rid of all the parts that you're likely not to be able to hear. Now, audiophiles say I can one. tell the difference, right? But but most of us can't. And that was what they were doing here is saying there's a lot of redundant information that the MRI scans, the machine learning can figure out what that is and get rid of it. Uh, and then we save we save the data. Uh, we, we use less data for that, and it speeds the process up. Uh, and when they tested it, the radiologists, only one of the five they tested could even... Uh, tell higher than random which ones were done by the machine learning, but they all agreed that the machine learning versions were actually higher quality because they got rid of noise by accident uh. Uh, when they were making the images. So the other thing is they only did this on images that had been scanned. They didn't actually apply this to the scanning as it was happening, so nobody benefited from it. Uh, but the the point is, if you can do it to the image, you can do it to the data as it's being created. Uh, but they still need to try that. They, they still need to do that part of it. So it's not quite ready for everybody to use yet. But I think it's really interesting. Well, on the note of the future, <laughs> and also <laughs> what everybody isn't using yet, but will be very interesting when we do, because we all want to have electronics implanted in our brains, right? We can merge with machines. We can become bionic. Everybody wants this. If for no. some reason you don't, the implants will fix that for you because <laughs> because it just make it more fun. But one problem is that the usual microelectronic materials, silicon, stainless steel, for example, they can cause scarring up there. You don't want that. Not good for your brain. It can also interrupt the electrical signals, which is the whole point of the implant in the first place. So it could be very messy. But a study led by the University of Delaware material science professor David Martin may have a solution for all of us. They coded components in a conjugated polymer called PDOT, P-E-D-O-T, often sold as an anti-static coating for electronic displays. The polymer did not cause scarring, lowered impedance for increased signal quality and battery life of components. So this will likely find its first use in medical implants that monitor for tumors, treat nervous system disorders, for example. But Martin wants to control how to deposit materials on a surface like circuits, and then put them in a living organism like a brain. So we are a ways out yet, but someday we will be machine people. <laughs> and I uh, hope you all are excited about that. Yeah. I think any kind of, uh, I mean, yeah, this this is definitely humorous, but I was, I was thinking of it, like, just to have some kind of device that will let you know if a, if a blood clot is traveling. Up. Yeah, right. Or to your, you know, brain. like like those are those you know, those are precious seconds because you won't know a lot of times until you you know obviously it's too late like some aneurysm or something like that so yeah I, I if I would I would prefer be less cybernetic for recreational reasons and more for health reasons if you get something that that can you know uh, yeah say aneurysm is coming or something like that I, I would yeah yeah that. no this yeah, this will be incredibly helpful for medical implants uh, right away uh, because the scarring is is an issue for a lot of reasons uh, and if and if this passes muster and gets FDA approval and all of that uh, then this sh this should be a, a big advantage uh, it will eventually be be used for 
you know, everyone's talking about implants that will deliver augmented reality. And, and actually, Dr. Martin, who worked on this research, uh, talks about putting AI in your brain as an assist, as a way to, to kind of give you that. That radiologist would, wouldn't even need the machine learning algorithm, right? He could just look at the image and the machine learning will like <laughs> reinterpret it for him. Uh, so, so, yeah, this, is, this has got some science fiction-y sounding uses. And I will be the old man saying, no, I'm not getting an implant, uh, kids. You can't make me, uh, but this, this would make it safer, uh, and that's good. This is yeah. good research. <laughs> yeah, is can the, you can you imagine? You know, ninety-five year old Tom. You know, all the kids are like, "Why are you still talking to that smart speaker?" You know, like, that's <laughs> good enough for me. You hold a phone in your hand. What's wrong with you? <laughs> the old ways. I like them. Uh, hey, folks, if you want to get the uh, the future in your head for five minutes at a time, at least before the implants come, uh, head to Daily Tech Headlines. You can get uh, Daily Tech Headlines five minutes a day at DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right. Let's catch you up on Epic and Apple. We mentioned a little bit yesterday, but just, just to catch you all the way up, last week, Epic used a server-side update to provide an alternate way to buy in-game currency that didn't use the Apple payment system and avoid sharing a 30% cut with Apple. And Apple said that's against the rules. They removed Fortnite from the Epic App Store and Epic sued Apple. And then the same thing happened with Google and Epic sued Google. Monday, this is what we talked about briefly on the show yesterday. Epic said Apple had told them they have until August 28th to change their Fortnite app to comply with App Store guidelines. In other words, take out that server-side input that gives you a second way to pay that's cheaper, or Epic would lose their membership in the Apple Developer Program. In a statement, Apple said, quote, we very much want to keep the company, referring to Epic, as part of the Apple Developer Program and their apps on the store. The problem Epic has created for itself is one that can easily be remedied if they submit an update of their app that reverts it to comply with the guidelines they agreed to and which apply to all developers. We won't make an exception for Epic because we don't think it's right to put their business interests ahead of the guidelines that protect our customers. Now, Epic could continue with their lawsuit and comply. They could they could change this, get back in the App Store, and still sue Apple saying they should have let us keep the change, right? It doesn't hurt the case. But instead, what Epic did was filed a request for a preliminary injunction to stop Apple from removing it from the developer program until the court case between the two companies is settled. Epic highlighted that this removal wouldn't just affect Fortnite, it would also affect the Unreal Engine. And this is something I wasn't sure about. Yeah, that's big. Unreal Engine is the code developers use to implement 3D graphics. Uh, it is made available for free. A paid license kicks in if your software makes more than a million dollars, but a lot of developers just use it for free to put 3D graphics in their games uh, and other things. Thousands of games use Unreal Engine, uh, including many of the games in Apple Arcade, but there are also non-game applications that use it. Uh, educational apps, visual effects software, also running on Mac and iOS. In its request for an injunction, Epic wrote that it, quote, would be unable to develop future updates to the Unreal Engine for use on iOS and Mac OS, and speculated that, quote, by spring 2021, it is likely that Apple will refuse to accept any new apps and updates to existing apps that use the Unreal Engine due to Epic's inability to access those tools. In other words, Unreal Engine will keep on working for now, even if they get kicked out of the developer program, but Epic would be prohibited from updating it as iOS and macOS SDKs change, and at some point, Unreal Engine on iOS and macOS would be so out of date that any apps that use it wouldn't pass review or possibly even work. Now, developers could decide to switch to the Unity Engine, which is already more popular for mobile and is free for software that makes less than $100,000 annually. But that's what Epic wrote in their injunction is, this could force everyone to switch to Unity, which would hurt our business. Uh, so you need to stop Apple from hurting our business in advance of this court case because we think we're going to win. Now, it, it seems like Epic, in the beginning of this, was a couple steps ahead of Apple. You know, they they, they knew what was going to happen. They had the lawsuit oh, they ready. Had they, had, yeah. they had the commercial. It but, was a Fortnite event. Okay, that that was that was good. Uh, <laughs> I wonder though, did they expect this move? Because 
this isn't, it, it seems the two shouldn't go together where Apple's trying to kick them out of the developer program because those two things aren't related. It seems like a- Apple's like, okay, we're going to find something to kind of s- stick it I'm to you not, with. I'm not surprised that Apple kicks them out of the developer program because really? they are unrepentantly violating the terms of the developer program, right? It wasn't like, hey, we had to kick your app out of the App Store. You may not have realized it, but it's illegal not to use the Apple Pay. Uh, and, and and Epic said, oh, sorry, our bad, we're resubmitting. Epic said, no, we're going to sue you. We're not going to change it. And so at that point, Apple can say, well, this violates your agreement with the developer program. I mean, the, the agreement to follow the App Store guidelines are in the developer program. Yeah, it's hard to say who, who I side with with this because it's like, it's a little bit... It's, I just kind of want to let the Titans fight fight it out and whatever. You know, it's all about money. I, I'm sure Epic just wants a better deal. I mean, Amazon Prime Video got a better deal. Uh, Netflix doesn't have to go with these terms, you know. So, you know, is Apple being a bully? Sure, it's their store. Uh, they can, you know, they can plan whatever they want. So I, I'm not sure where the lawsuit's going to go with that since it's a private company. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know who to feel sympathetic for here. Well, I mean, I, I know what... Epic is going for, listen, we want App Store policies to change. Google's as well, not just Apple, but, you know, their primary fight is with Apple right now. Uh, And look at all of the third-party, smaller software developers who are going to be hurt by something like this going forward. It's not just us. It's a whole ecosystem of folks who are getting screwed because if you can't use something like our Unreal Engine, you know, people are going to have to start over or they're going to, you know, the apps are just going to sort of fall apart or not get updated and get supported anymore. And, you know, there's talk of of Epic kind of trying to rally some other troops of companies who have been in public spats with Apple in the past for their own reasons. So I think that, you know, that exactly Spotify is one of them. Um, And Spotify has been actually vocal. I think it was last week uh, that the company came out and said that they were supporting Epic in their fight against Apple because Spotify has, has had some of the same issues with the company. So, you know, that whole kind of like rally the troops thing that Epic is doing, I think is is very smart. I still don't know how they beat Apple in court because, you know, the rules are the rules sort, sort of thing. And that's been working for Apple, you know, thus far. But I don't know. I, I do see some folks saying, well, Epic, you know, you don't like the rules, go develop somewhere else. But I th- there's, there's so many people involved potentially in something like this that I, I don't think it's is as cut and dry as two companies. Who do you side with? Uh, yeah. I, as we said on Friday's show, I, I think there is definitely basis to file an anti-competitive lawsuit here, right? It's clear that Apple is controlling the App Store and not allowing competing App Stores on there. Uh, whether that is in fact antitrust is a whole different situation. That involves, are they abusing their market position? Does it hurt consumers that they're doing this? And we talked about that. If you want to listen on Friday's show, we went through that. What I think uh, is happening here, Lamar, is, I think you nailed it. Uh, this is a negotiation. Uh, Tim Sweeney blasted Microsoft over the Windows Store in March 2016, and eventually Microsoft eased up on the universal Windows platform, and now Epic hearts Microsoft, according to a recent interview on VentureBeat. Uh, in April 2019, Epic promised to end its Epic Game Store exclusive if Steam would raise its revenue cut for developers. They were pushing to get more money to all developers, not just Epic. Sound familiar? Well, Valve didn't do that. In fact, Steam may have been burdened to improve itself because of the competition, so he didn't win that one. He won with Microsoft. He didn't so much with Valve. And this Venture Beat article where he said, I heart Microsoft in, in May of 2019, uh, has some very interesting quotes. So I want to finish on these. Uh, He said, I think there was a time when everybody looked at Apple and their 30% take with a deal of envy. That's being increasingly questioned. And there's a realization that open platforms are more trusted by developers. So he's signaling where he wants to go back then. Uh, He said, publishers and developers can invest with much greater confidence because we know that we will be able to receive the fruits of our labor when they're talking about open platforms. He sung Windows praises. He says on Windows, there's a Windows store, there's Steam, there's Origin, there's Battle.net. There's Epic Games. And, you know, having multiple stores keeps every store honest and creates a really healthy competitive dynamic. So there's an out for Apple if they want to just, you know what, Apple's probably going to win, but maybe they don't want the trouble and the bad press. Why don't you let some, like you let Amazon have a special exemption for video, have a store exemption for streaming games like Stadia Mm. for Epic Games. 
And then uh, if you're wondering why Sweeney is not mad at consoles that also take 30% and lock you in, he says, they're television attached gaming devices as opposed to general computing platforms. You're not doing spreadsheets there. It's a different experience. And generally consoles over their history are subsidized hardware. So that seems to be what he thinks is the difference. I think he's pushing for some kind of exemption like that. Yeah, fascinating. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Not surprisingly, this is one of the stories that's been at the top of the page lately. You can submit stories that you care about and want others to as well and vote on stories at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Uh, Russell lives in the UK and had some thoughts on our UK exam story from the show yesterday. And it's great, Russell. We really appreciate this because you're on the ground. Russell noted a few details that lended to the outrage that was happening uh, in those parts, particularly from students and teachers, such as teachers complaining that their estimated grades and rankings that they spend a lot of time on were barely used in the data. Independent private schools were usually smaller in size because, you know, they cost more. So they ended up using more data from teachers, skewing the results, and that the UK algorithm was specifically targeted at reducing the grade inflation to zero, which in turn had to generate many unfair downgrades to make that happen, balanced by other unfair upgrades. Russell says, big data isn't perfect. It'll probably always have bias. So you can only use it for automated final decisions if you're happy with the inevitable mistakes. Using AI to put the right news in my feed, it's fine, even if it's not perfect. Using AI alone to prosecute, prosecute criminals, not okay, because errors are considered unacceptable. Turns out that messing up the careers of many young school leavers to avoid being overly generous to others, also not acceptable. Algorithms are not completely outside the control of non-technical pol policymakers, and they should not get away with, it was the algorithm, it's out of our hands. They can still choose to lean towards false positive or false negative, and they get to decide whether to use algorithms as final decisions or as a screen before detailed checks. Policymakers could ask face recognition technicians, for example, to set the confidence very high, avoiding false arrests, but letting more criminals escape. The UK government might have avoided all of the fallout in this particular case by individually checking that there were that students were that were more than one grade up or down, you know, take a closer look. Russell says, basically, I see this as a policy question, not really a technical one, even if the UK exam algorithm was also flawed. Well said, Russell. Thank you for that on the ground report. Very much so. Keep them coming, everybody. Uh, always good to know uh, how people feel in parts of the world that we are not in. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Miss Music Teacher, Chris Smith, and Tim Ashman. Also, thanks to Lamar Wilson. Two weeks in a row, Lamar. I know you're a busy man. Where should people follow your work? Uh, I will be back every week. Tom just doesn't know it yet. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would welcome that. <laughs> but yeah, you can check me out on, on Twitter just for my general feed of cool stuff I upload and, and uh, lots of different genres, including tech. Uh, and that's at twitter.com slash Lamar Wilson. Thank you. Uh, keep it coming, folks. We love your support, and we try to give you all kinds of cool perks at patreon.com slash DTNS. Shannon Morse uh, delivers a weekly ThreatWire security update to you that goes into the Patreon feed if you're a patron. So go check it out, patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback, send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday. That's at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Put it on your calendar, 2030 UTC for your UTC people, and find out more at Daily Tech News show.com slash live back tomorrow with scott johnson talk to you then this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program <laughs>